I don't miss that house, and I don't miss that neighborhood, and I don't know why. Is it too loud? Is it okay? Um, feels hey, good. It feels good? Feels good, yeah. Yeah, sometimes you're just done with a place. I get it. <laughs> no, I'm a moving motherfucker, man. I, like, all the time. <laughs> you do? I, sh- I don't know why. It always is like a relationship ends, something crazy happens. I, I, it's always a fucking reason. Yeah. But it's like every three, four years. I really? Move. Yeah. Do you, I, do you, what about all your shit? My shit all goes. It's in store. <laughs> but I just, like, did a move, like, during, I think since I last saw you. Yeah. I got married. No, I was already married when I last saw you. Right. I think. Maybe. How long have you been but married? I've I, I, I been married just over uh, to like two years. Yeah, well, maybe. Yeah. It would have just been before, right before the pandemic. Yeah, before the pandemic. But I think the, the fundraiser before that, Yeah. I met my wife at. Right. Yeah, I no met shit. her there. Yeah. And what did she do? She's a designer. Right. Like a designer of what kind? What kind she's of like design? Shoes, clothes. I think, yeah, I remember. Stuff. Yeah, I met her the last time we did it. The last one that we did was with uh, Eddie Vedder was there. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, we were together then. Is it like, second wife, third wife? Um, Second. Yeah. Yeah. I got married the first time in 1988. Um. Wow. Shotgun wedding. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. 88. Full on pregnant 19 year old. Wow. Yeah. I was 24. Oh my God. Yeah. But you did it. You stepped up. Yeah. No, I loved her. Yeah. I loved her. And we have a 33 year old daughter who's just the most amazing human being on the planet. She's 33 now? Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And, and just like a ray of light, man. Really? What does she do? She's a photographer. Uh huh. Yeah, and she does, you know, lots of fashion stuff. She does her art stuff, you know, her own thing. Yeah. But she works in fashion a lot, and she made a short film that went to Cannes or to Sundance a few years ago. Yeah. She's a director and a writer and just a cool person, just like a kind, considerate. Smart. Do you feel like a dad or just like a dude she knows? A dad. You do? <laughs> That's <Yeah>. good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it doesn't. Do you have kids? I don't. Oh, okay. But I know my relationship with my parents. Yeah. It's kind of weird. Like, I, I don't, like, I know they're my parents, but they're just sort of these weirdos I grew up with. Yeah. I mean, had it, problems. Might, it, it might be like that, too, for her and not for me. Yeah. But I, I was concerned that when she got older, she wouldn't be my little girl anymore. Right. But she's still my little girl. It happens, huh? It happens, like it, like yeah. She, Even though now we talk about, like, you know, Louis Benwell and, oh, nice. you know, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, social issues and stuff. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's. But you always had a good relationship with her all the way through? Mm hmm. Uh, teenage years were a little rough. But that's just normal. But I mean, there was no sort of, like, weird, like, you know, she didn't see you for years on end. No, or, no, never. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you're with the mother, too? You're all right? Yeah, no, good. Like, her mother's the most awesome person, became a rehab counselor. Oh, yeah. It's, like, really. Successful yeah. and and awesome at her job in that world. Yeah, and it's just like like profoundly uh, spiritual person and helping people. Yeah, helps it's, people. It's just, interesting, like the people that because I'm sober too. You are like, but mm-hmm. there are people that like you know lock into it, like Bob Forrest, you know, who are like just yeah. sober wizards. Yeah, she and worked with Bob for a while. Him. Oh, she did. Yeah, at his place or whatever. Um, doesn't he no, have a, doesn't they he worked have a at their own place at, at a different place in Pasadena. You know, one thing about her, yeah, and is that. I've lent so much money to so many people in my life, yeah. <laughs> and no one has ever paid me back. Ever. Ever. Like, I don't loan money anymore. If I, I'll give it to someone if I have it, if I can. Give it I, to them. You know, but I won't loan, because they don't pay back, and it ruins a friendship. It does, and it's a weird thing about that, because everyone tells you that. If you loan somebody money, you're not going to get it back, like if it's a friend. Yeah, and, and, it's just, and, and, and they might mean to, but... But the thing is that, like, I lent her, like, you know, a substantial amount of money at one point, and, like, I know she, you know, she makes, she works hard. Yeah. Makes a salary, not a lot of money. She yeah. gets by, you know, yeah. her and her husband. Yeah. And, like, ten years later, comes a knocking on the door. <laughs> hey, here's that money. I, I, like, I know that she got, like, a few hundred here. Right, right. A few hundred, fifty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And did it and paid yeah. me back, and, uh, you know. Well, you know, when you're sober, you got to make that shit right, or else you got to right. apologize for it. <laughs> yeah, you got to own up to <laughs> I'm your so, shit. I'm sorry. You're never going to get that money back. Yeah. But I feel bad about it, but I want to take responsibility for my side. <laughs> yeah. But you're never going to fucking get <laughs> yeah. your money back. Yeah, you're fucked, but I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I own up to it. Exactly. Yeah. So what? that's the only kid you have? You have other ones? I have two kids. I have a 16-year-old daughter as well. So yeah. that's like a whole second shot at it. You're doing, yeah. it, you're doing it differently? Um, 
I mean, yeah, like, I mean, I'm better now, I think, as a human being. Um, but, but different woman, right? Different woman and entirely different kid with a different, you know, worldview and a different time. They're 17 years apart. You yeah. Know? Um, but, you know, just a beautiful kid. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah. And do you, do you spend a lot of time with her? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Where, where's the, who's the mother of that one? Uh, her name is Frankie. Yeah. Yeah. It's her just mom. <laughs> just yeah. mom. Yeah. I don't feel like I, you know, I should. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, know. you can't. Yeah. But you get along with her though? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, for the most part. <laughs> yeah. We yeah, do yeah. good. We do good. So this, like this new record, I didn't realize that you guys, like you've recorded so many records with Ruben. Mm hmm. Like over and over again with that guy. Yeah, yeah. The last one is the first one we haven't done with him since Blood Sugar in nineteen ninety. The getaway. Yeah, the getaway. You we didn't did, do we with did, him. Did with Danger Mouse. And we and and how was that a different experience? Completely different in the way, like the big. It's really a philosophical difference. Yeah. In that, Rick and I think what makes Rick great outside of just like a you know an insult, uh, an insight, and a degree of objectivity that just is born of his you know his state of being is that what Rick does and the reason that he's able to make such a varied, like a wildly varied quantity of music from, yeah. from like the early hip hop stuff he made yeah. to Slayer, to Johnny Cash, yeah. to Bangles, to us, to Tom Petty, right. to like, you know, spiritual hippie music, you yeah. know, like all this stuff is that he doesn't have a thing. Like, it's not like, oh, here's my Rick Rubin sound yeah. and I'm Phil Spector and this is what it sounds like right. and, and this is me. He sees what the essence is of the thing that he loves. He has to love it or he doesn't do it. Right. He sees what that thing is and then does his best to help you bring that thing out. Well, I think he I think that his thing is is some sort of naturalism. Like I, I think his thing is to not get in the way because there's a lot of stuff, you know, especially with the the, the stripped down stuff he does with the older artists that where you're like this is just it's almost like jazz production where you're not putting anything on it. You're yeah. just letting the guys be in a room. Yeah, let them be in a room. Yeah. His thing like is particularly with us is he was the first person that let us do that. Mm -hmm. And this was it was our fifth record, Blood Sugar Sex Magic that yeah. we made with him. And every time we had been into the studio before, we'd tense up. It would be like, Okay, now it's the studio and it's serious and there's this big huge board and all these blinking lights and yeah. knobs and but you had you had you had done work you'd work with Clinton George Clinton before yeah, that, George, right? George yeah, George George was different. George we were just high. <laughs> we didn't know I was like, whoa, look at the knobs. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. I mean, it was really fun. But what was that? Up with Mofo party plan? No, that was freaky styly with George. Oh. And that was a fantastic experience. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and, but, but different. You know, I, it was less organized. Um, but did but, you learn any tricks from George? Yeah. Um, like, I mean, like, more like little a, things he would say, yeah. you know, little things he would say, like, like he'd have like someone come in to arrange the horns from yeah. Fred Wesley, right? The great yeah. Fred Wesley yeah. of, of, from JB's. And he'd be like, Fred came in the night before to do a horn arrangement. He goes, yeah, don't give him too much time. As yeah. soon as he starts thinking, he's going to start doing all these incredible orchestrations. But first thought, best thought, like yeah. that's what funk is. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Trusting your gut and yeah. just letting that flow. Yeah. And I know his gut is beautiful. So just let him do the first thing. He hears, write it down, boom, yeah, yeah, record yeah. that shit tomorrow. Right. Things like that, you know, and like him saying, like talking about playing live, like he was like how when they first blew up, you know, when they had the mothership come out in the mid 70s and it was like they had been playing for already for years and years, touring yeah, on yeah. playing clubs, playing theaters, doing whatever they could. And all of a sudden they're playing these big arenas and they blew up. And he said, he's like, I always told everyone, like, just don't be intimidated by the front of the stuff that you see. Play to the last person in the last row. Open yourself up and think like that and let that energy flow. Yeah, I, I need more of that in my life. Yeah. Because you focus on the front row, you're going to see the one guy that's looking shitty. And yeah. you're going to be like, oh, fuck. Yeah. Are we fucking up? Yeah. And you're literally playing for this one dude that you think you're disappointing yeah. in front of, like, what, 15,000 people? <laughs> yeah. Well, I always have this thing where I think about the one person I'm there. Like, yeah. you know, like, I remember, like playing in Minneapolis at First Avenue and they said, Prince is coming tonight. Yeah. And the whole show, all I can think about is Prince is going to like this bass line. Yeah. Or, oh, I messed up. Prince is going to be, he's going to think I'm a, you know, I'm an yeah, unfunky yeah. white boy. Oh, you know, like, I'm just like, 
all these thoughts. Did I don't come? even know if he came. You I have no know. idea. But but many times with certain people, like you know, much uh, less. Who did you get nervous around? I talked to Bootsy. Mm. It was on Zoom, and you know the mic was kind of in and out, and he's wearing <laughs> his hat and his glasses on Zoom, and I'm like, yeah. no one's going to see this, bro. <laughs> yeah, he's Bootsy. <laughs> yeah, he's Bootsy. I, w- I was talking to Chris Rock the other day, and yeah. he was saying how he once worked with James Brown on a, an episode of. Miami Vice, yeah, and that James Brown showed up, and it was like you know seven a.m. call for yeah. Miami Voice, or whatever. Showed up in the morning, like completely gig ready, like in a full body <laughs> pantsuit, like glittery, yeah, you know, yeah. thing. His hair done, like everything, yeah, to like you know get in Miami Vice wardrobe and do whatever he was going to do. But that was his uh, morning outfit. It just you know, it's yeah. like he's he's, James Brown, T. James Brown, and Bootsy's Bootsy, and yeah. you know what I mean. It's like a legacy that they take so, seriously. But, but like outside of Bootsy. And uh, uh, and and the, the only the couple other producers. I mean, it's like all Rick Rubin stuff. Man. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry to go on such a tangent, I'd but not, so fine. the thing the thing the difference between Rick and, s- and someone Danger. like Danger Mouse is is Rick takes the artist, wants to make them bring out the thing that they do the best that they can be, and hopefully organ help them arrange the songs mm. where the essence of the song, which is the thing that's magic about it, shines. Yeah. As opposed to burying it in the outro or like we might do, like oh that's a cool point, we save it for the end. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever it is. Um, whereas Danger Mouse is more of a guy like he has a sound. Yeah, all his records sound like Danger Mouse. Yeah. you know what I mean. Which and you be, wanted that. We we were to try something different. Yeah. you know, and and with the lineup he had at the time with Josh and Klinghoffer. Um, yeah, it was I Josh Klinghoffer. Yeah, and Josh and 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 Brian Danger Mouse were close and okay. had worked together a lot before, and it just seemed like a a fun uh, way to go about it. So what's it like being with Frusciante back? It's so beautiful, man. <laughs> It's so beautiful. Yeah. It, it was, you know, it was difficult to 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 make that transition to let go of Josh, who is not only a great musician but is like an incredibly supportive, yeah, good guy, bandmate, a good yeah. dude, a dude that shows up and like he'll like you know you've heard a rehearsal tape and he'll like drive across town in the middle of the night to bring it to you because yeah. once you hear that idea, like just a caring, yeah, supportive, yeah, like yeah, all yeah. in dude, yeah. Um, but you know, John. <laughs> He was just born to, to do this, man. Yeah. He was born to do it. and, and To be a chili pepper? He, yes. To be the guitar player <laughs> with chili peppers. Like, just like the way that he functions in, in relationship to the rest of us. It makes, like, we're all so different than one another, but it makes every one of us be ourselves as much as we can be, and every part is taken care of. And it's difficult, too, because we're all different, yeah. and we see things differently, and we argue, and because we all bring something completely different to the table. And it's so heavy because, like, musically, you're a trio. I yeah, mean, yeah, you know, in that way, yeah, and and so right, right, just instrumentally, you know. Yeah. I mean, Anthony sings, but I mean, that's you know, everyone's got to really <laughs> show up for work, yeah, and show up and be a fucking hero, yeah. You know what I mean? And and uh, John's like, man, he's intense. He's an unbelievably, you know, you know, virtuosic musician as well as has an encyclopedic knowledge of music. Like, yeah. Because since he was a little boy, if he liked somebody, yeah. like say he liked you know, the germs or right. liked, like the Yingve Malmsteen or Steve Vai, whoever it is. He didn't just like that person and learn every single note they ever played in their lives. Yeah. He found out who they liked and found all those people, learned every note they ever played in their lives and who they liked. It goes all the way back in history. Really? Like he's a studier, man. He really? is a serious, diligent dude. And everything that he gets into, whether it's, you know, electronic music or it's classical music or yeah. it's rock guitar playing yeah. or whatever it is. Is is he just studies, man? He's focused and he has the ability to do it for ten hours, right? But then, but, like, sitting. but in his playing, you know, he he's like, you know, he lets it happen. He doesn't seem like he's insecure or or, or acting like anybody else. Really, he seems pretty like laid back in, Not, in his groove. Well, absolutely. I think he's really come to a place too where he doesn't need it all in any way to prove the power. It's like the thing of like a monk playing one note and you feel that he can play ten right. notes. Yeah, I say John. Um, is so comfortable in himself as a musician that he doesn't need to prove it. Like, it, but right. it's all there. Yeah. Like he, his approach to this record, and he did so much on this record. You know, like the guitar playing, all these synths and orchestrations yeah, yeah. and ideas, all the background vocals. But it comes from a really humble place. Like he just wants to serve the music in the most beautiful way, and he can just play this simple liquid thing that he doesn't need to show. 
Oh, you know, all the things that he knows. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, the first album that I ever got of, of, of yours, it's weird because like, you know, and I hear that with John. I mean, I understand how you guys all fit, but the first, the first record I ever got when I was working in a coffee shop, I guess it was 19 shit. I don't even know when that came out, but it was uh, Uplift, uh, Mofo Party Point. Okay. Well, that's with Hillel. Right. I know. And, and the thing about like Hillel is like, that band that you guys were at that time, that seemed to set the standard, didn't it? Like in terms of like templates of who we were? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, from the beginning, we had we had tapped into a thing that we loved just from our reference points growing up. Right. You know, and it was from like music that was exciting us at the time, contemporary yeah. music like hip hop and the real, like we really loved, you know, English post punk. We really loved like the, the no New York kind of New York yeah. thing that was yeah, happening yeah, at the yeah. time. And the funk bands bounce like the contortions and the lounge lizards and defunct and you know, all of that stuff yeah. that had this like beautiful thing of like jazz and funk and R and B and hip hop with this real noisy, dissonant you know yeah. and punk rock and all of p-funk like everything that we loved and it's really like halal and jack grew up loving kiss and aerosmith and classic rock i grew up hating that stuff i grew up loving louis armstrong and john coltrane and miles davis and dizzy gillespie because you had it in the house yeah i grew up my stepdad was a jazz musician and that was what i was around you know yeah and, and that was from when i was a little kid and i saw my stepdad play in the living room with his jazz buddies in new york you know i was just like rolling on the floor in hysterics in a state of ecstasy at the, what was happening and it seemed How like old were you then seven where were you born i was born in australia but you're not australian are I, you well I, I left when i was four do you I, have a can you I, be can you I still do, yeah there? i still have an australian passport yeah. you do uh -huh. you just keep it up to date yeah man yeah when you might have to go yeah dude <laughs> <laughs> you got that in the back burner. <laughs> back burner. I'm My, out ski. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, do you ever go back there though? Um, I do. I do whenever I can. My have, fa my father. You know, I have a lot of family there who I don't know that well. Cause really? I didn't grow up with them. They yeah, had like a whole slew of you know aunts and uncles and cousins and nephews and nieces. Which, and, what, what's the real name? My, my yeah, name. Yeah. My name is Michael Peter Balzeri. Belzery. B a l z is in zebra a r y. And and uh, it's a, a Hungarian name. It is a Hungarian name, but I whenever I go to Hungary, like we'll go play Budapest. Yeah. Um, I always like I'll ask them, and I'll be like, no. Yeah. But I think you know immigration. They had like their version in Australia, right. Of uh, like Ellis Island, where the right. name would just get fucked up in the in the So transit. you think it got, it got? I think it did. Yeah. But my dad, I don't know my my family tree well, but my dad tracked it down to a little village in Hungary on yeah. the side. Yeah. And he just knows that when they they came from Ireland and Hungary to Australia, you know, because the potato family. Your mom's from I Ireland. No, no, my dad's family is from Ireland and Hungary, okay. came to Australia, okay. and my mom's family is from the north of England, from Yorkshire. So you have a, a good relationship with your old man? Yeah, really good. It was it's difficult when, you know, because I left. He left when I was really young, when I was about seven, and he left and went back to Australia. And my mom remarried a jazz musician guy. Wow, who's my stepdad? Who is yeah. the guy that I was and around? That, and, that, and that set the uh, that that reconfigured the brain. It totally reconfigured the brain, like in in a way that <laughs> my my father worked for the Australian government. We had come from Australia to New York because yeah. he had a four year assignment at the right. Australian consulate. Yeah. He was a straight up and down suit, briefcase to work every yeah. day on the subway, came home, you know, we lived in the suburbs, dinner at seven, that was it. set the table, yeah. no, like, real straight. And then my mom, like, was like, you know, getting a wild hair, man. She came from provincial Australia, yeah. where that would have been the dream. Your dad yeah. had a suit, yeah. suit thing, right. and you know, cocktail parties, everything was solid. Yeah. And then my, she met, you know, she started, like, took off for... Like, I think it was the Mont, uh, not Woodstock, but some jazz festival. What's the one they had up in upstate New York where Duke Ellington did the famous... Uh, uh, Newport? Newport Jazz yeah, Festival, yeah, saw yeah. Miles, you know, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. all that. And came back in a dashiki and... This is, she She went to New York on her own? And no, just, uh, well, no, we went, came, went with my dad and my mom, and we okay. all went together, my yeah. dad. But then my mom started branching out. Uh -huh. And anyway, she, you know, my that parents split up. Yeah. My mom took off with a jazz musician. My dad went back to Australia. Uh -huh. Without us, you know, broken hearted, this kids and wife yeah. gone. You know, my mom sure. left him. Oh, and, um, but my, oh, my, so then we moved from my dad in the suburban house, real straight, to a heroin addict jazz musician who lived in his parents' basement. We went there. 
Uh, yeah, wow. and, um, and and that was it. And that was like, and that was at the point where it was like, do whatever you want. Yeah, you know what I mean. Well, so, see, I'm going out in the street. I'll be home at three in the morning. Yeah. Uh, the next so, day, it was like, hey, how you doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just not not the greatest parenting skills. No, but, no, just, but yeah, but you know, but I'm so grateful for that too. Like, yes, well, you survived. It, I survived one. Um, two, I found myself on my own. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, like, I get it. But like, like but that, but to, to also be inspired by that sort of like where creativity and uh, addiction are the priorities. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's the whole life. Yeah. Right. That, you know, as negative as that sounds, it is, there's a freedom to it. It's selfish, but it enabled you to sort of figure out who you were. It, I had to figure it out on my own because yeah. no one was doing it for me. And in ways. And you got a sister too, right? I have an older sister as well. Yeah. 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 She's an awesome person. I um, met her. I met her at the, oh, at, great. At the uh, benefit. Oh, great. A couple times. Yeah. Great. We sat at the same table. Oh, cool. She's a character. Yeah, yeah. She's a character. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute character. Was she drinking? <laughs> a little. I, she became more of a character as the night went on. <laughs> I love my sister. So, okay. So, you're doing that. You're, you're just out in the street. You're eight years old. Yeah. And then and we moved to L.A. when I turned 11 for his music career. And and did he did he have one? Um, very minimal. It was like what was, what was well, he was a jazz musician. What he was was he wanted playing? to play jazz, what did a he play? bass, a bright, so, bass. a bright bass player. So it really it really made an impact. Yeah, no, intensely, and and I think often how much I approach music like he did, and like in terms of my strengths and my weaknesses, like what and stuff like, like that, how? like I'm not that great of a soloist, and I'm really working on it right now. Actually, I want to get better. You're and, pretty good, though. No, thank you. I mean, I I I do my best. What, what, where are the insecurities? I mean, what make what? How do you define like I hear being a like, soloist? I hear like Thundercat solo oh, or yeah. Mono <laughs> Neon or Jocko or the great soloists. Yeah, and I'm just I don't I never learned those patterns, those ways in around all those chord changes and stuff. Yeah, like I just didn't do it. Like I was more like like when they were like studying and learning all those cerebral parts of music. I was like in a van sleeping on you know people's floors. And you were and playing Motel bass. Six was playing punk rock gigs. Exactly, but you were the rhythm section, so yes. your your sensibility was. But I, but I can groove like no one's business. Yeah, I know. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and um, my stepdad was like that. Like when I looked back, I, I and I. It, it's only recently dawned on me, but I remember yeah. watching him play, and he played with really great jazz guys in New York, yeah. and I'd see him play. And he'd be like playing those fast bebop bass lines, you know? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Going, going, yeah, going yeah, for yeah, a fucking yeah, yeah, long time. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Serious, yeah. man. Hard yeah. as a bottomless pit of yeah. monster yeah. fucking groove. Yeah. Like, you can't even believe it. And I was so in awe. But even as a little kid, I knew, and everyone would solo over the changes, right? They'd play the right. head, then all the yeah. jazz guys take their solos, you yeah. know? Yeah, And then I love the way come... jazz guys stand around while the other guy's playing. Yeah, just wait for... Just kind of smoke a cigarette, yeah. wait it out. Go off, get a drink, you know, <laughs> hit on this, uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah. You know, read a book, yeah. anything. Yeah. But when it would come his time to solo, he would get he would keep that ferocity, but it would just kind of like, I'd see him kind of seize up. Choke, yeah. You know, like, it wasn't like he would choke you, just his approach was just like, he'd be like, bang, 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 bang. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. it was cool, but, yeah. and I realized I kind of do the same thing. Huh. You know what you I mean? You think it's an insecurity? Maybe. I think, part, yeah, I think part of it is, like, I've noticed that of myself, sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm not that good at that, and I'll, I'll, uh, like, once I was playing with Ornette Coleman for a little bit. Really? Mm hmm And there was one. How old was he when you were playing with him? Towards the end of his life. You know, the last, I played with him a few times over the last, like, eight, nine years of his life. That must have been challenging. I mean, he's out yeah, there. Yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah? It was an incredibly what great What kind of experience. freedom does that give you to play with Ornette Coleman? What's the responsibility it, of the bass player in that situation? Was it a trio? Uh, no, it was a, a pretty big band. Oh, okay. Two, two bass players, two drummers. Oh, okay. Um, oh, no, one drummer. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, you know, electric bass and upright bass. How do you approach that, though? What are you thinking when you're playing well, with Ornette? Well, the thing is, uh, when I thought, when I got ready to play with him, yeah. his son, Donardo, who's kind of the band leader, uh -huh. who plays drums with him, Donardo sent me uh, all his songs to learn. And, you know, I know Ornette music, but, but so I, for months, I was learning these complicated pieces of music. And we, I got there, and Ornette was like, 
<laughs> just play whatever you want, <laughs> whatever you feel at any time. But you were prepared. Yeah, but but just looking at him and him telling me that, I never felt so free in my life. You know what I mean? And playing it like I was really ha- happy with the way I played. Like I felt so free and so good and on top of my game. And I was really connecting with the dudes. Yeah. We played with the master musicians of Jujuka and Salif Keita and Patti Smith. And there was this whole, all these people. It was yeah. just so fun. And, you know, real like, like really uplifting experience, um, but then uh, towards the end of his life, I, I, the, right before he died, they, he had a show at Central Park in New York, uh-huh. and I went and played. And he didn't actually play. Well, I didn't play with him. I'm not sure if he got up and played or not. Yeah. But it was with his band and his son, and we were practicing. And all these guys, great free jazz guys, were playing solos. Really, yeah, like great yeah, shows. Yeah. And and then Donato was like, "Point to me, go, man." I got. I just seized up. Hmm. Started playing like shit. Like yeah. I just got scared. Yeah, you know what I mean. And, yeah. and it's so you know, it's a part of my musicianship that I'm working on developing. So, so, but what's the process of that? You're just learning the runs. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm just trying to just like I instead of just I'm just like yeah, like just soloing. Like last night I was playing, or the night before I was playing, soloing over what's going on by Mar- Marvin Gaye. Like just plan, you know, just like uh, through do the thing that you did when you were a kid. You put the record on and you yeah, ma- make up melodies, you know, but initially. So your approach, like at, at, once you guys moved to, well, what was the situation in the house? How alcoholic and crazy was it? Uh, very much so um, terrifying, you know, as a kid, yeah. um, he, you know, was extremely violent. He was, he would bash up the whole house and smash it to smithereens. Oh my God. He, so like you, you know, he would, he would just lose it. The cops would come. Oh my God. So God. you're in bed. You don't know what's going to happen ever. Don't know. Yeah. Like I used to sleep in the backyard and stuff because I just didn't know. You know what I mean? Like, is he going to lose it tonight? It seems a little testy. Did he beat you up? No, he didn't. Oh, so he didn't, he, he didn't. abused the house? He never did that. He actually, people. he, yeah, yeah. I think that, you know, or himself or, I don't know if he ever hit my mom or not. I'm not really sure. I, I, I don't. I feel like it's like I. It's not really my place to talk about yeah. that stuff and other people. But um, it, it was, was just terrifying. it was scary. And then he got sober. He did. You know, he got sober. Yeah, he got sober and stayed sober. Uh, yeah. Well, he got sober when you got to L.A. or when? Um, no, years and years after that. We moved oh, to L.A. Wow. in '72. He got sober in like 1980. Were you part of that? Yeah, I would go like I, they made me go to Alatine. Oh, oh, so uh, I would go to Al. Yeah, I got like kind of roped into it, and I yeah. would go like and bring him his cake when he had his year. When thing. did you start using? Uh, I started getting high when I was eleven. Yeah, weed. Yeah. Weed at first, yeah. Yeah, weed, and then that acid was when you got and... here to L- you're yeah. in L.A. Mm-hmm. already. Yeah. So you moved to L.A. from New York, mm-hmm. and your dad's your stepdad's here for work. Yeah. And, uh, are well, you, yeah, for, you know, for like a fresh start jet, kind of sure, thing. Yeah. You know, it's like when you're a drug addict, there's always yeah, a fresh yeah, start yeah, somewhere. Yeah. But the, You know a guy he, he, out yeah, in California yeah, yeah. who's going to get you the gig? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And did, did he integrate into the scene out here or what? Um, he did somewhat, yeah. you know. I mean... It's a I, tough scene, I, I think, man. It's a small yeah. scene, right? And at I, that I, time. I think, and for jazz at that time as well, you know, I think that... It, for people like him... It was like 72, 72? Yeah, 72, we came to L.A., November 14th, yeah. 1972. And I think for jazz musicians at that time who grew up, you know, like in the 40s and the 50s and yeah. the 60s, like admiring the jazz bebop greats, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, oh, like, yeah, yeah. like just like in studying and learning this yeah, extremely yeah, yeah. sophisticated music, you know, and then come like the 70s, no one gave a shit, man. You know what yeah, I mean? Things it was were like, shifting. They barely gave a shit then, but it had a lot more tension. It had tension, and uh, it also had like... Well, people but paid it, attention to uh, it. Yeah, uh, tension and attention. Yes. And it was like a, a rich bohemian culture yes. that really loved it. Come to 70s, it was like, yeah. you know, unless for a very select few, it was really hard to make any kind of a living. And, and also like, and fusion came. Fusion came, and like many like him, they really like kind of became bitter. Yeah. You know, like angry at, at, you know, the rock musicians who they see these guys who couldn't play at all, who are making billions of yeah, dollars. Right. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and they didn't just. They, didn't they get bitter about fusion too? 
Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I don't know. I, I can't remember him beating, but it was definitely looked down their nose at everything except their thing yeah. to their detriment. Because yeah. there's thing is the guys who were really great who embraced everything yeah. had a chance of really Figured reaching out, out and touching. Yeah. But like, and and you know, he was like many a substance abuse problem. You know, jazz musician who no one you know, and he's doing like you know Holiday Inn lounges and remember he got like the Princess Cruises gig, you know, playing for the Ink Spots. He was playing with the version of the ink spot that must have just i can't imagine that that gig like those kind of gigs i I see it in comedy or any kind of art form like you have to rationalize that how do you not stay bitter yeah the thing is i he was happy to get work okay you know what i mean because like he worked fixed cars in the backyard my mom worked as a legal secretary car guy huh yeah he knew how to fix cars you know he was mechanical so okay so now you're in la are you Mm -hmm. running the streets like wild. Yeah. From when I, I got to L.A. It smoking was like, weed, doing acid at 11? Smoking weed. Yeah. I don't think I first did acid till I was God, 15 with Anthony, when I met Anthony. Yeah. Um, How's he doing? Oh, he's good, man. Okay. He's good. He's like, you know, <laughs> real focused on our thing right now. Yeah. You know, we got it. We made this double record and we're psyched, you know. I know the record is great. It sounds like a little bit of everything you all do for the, like, it's, a, it's, it's, it feels like a, a career record. Thank you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, like, you know, we've done all this stuff <laughs> and we can do all this stuff. And this is the evolution of all this stuff. Yeah. It's just for, for us feeling like, we just got into a room and were ourselves at the best that we could be. Encour- right. Encouraging one another. Just the best that we are. Like, that's us. I can't say, like, put this record out. I can't say, well, you know, we did good at this, but we kind of like, no, this is as good as we are. Yeah. You yeah, know, you we have record to do it that. live in a room, live to tape. You oh, know, you did. Yeah, yeah. We record live to tape. You know, we overdub and stuff afterwards, sure. of course. But, but, um. Is that the Ruben way or did you do uh, all your records like that? I mean, did you, I mean. It's, Ruben's very good with it. Yeah. But he's also knows it's more convenient and easier to do stuff on con- in computers in a lot of ways and yeah. sending files around and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. But, man, we just, we like that sound. John, like, is very into, to, the way things sounds and has like his ears like you know how like a dog can hear someone whistling yeah. a mile away. So you guys are in your your own little areas in the studio playing live together? Yeah, well we're all in the room together. Right. We just baffled off the amps in right. different yeah, yeah. rooms oh, or whatever, okay, right. isolation yeah, yeah, yeah. booths. Yeah, yeah. And we're all in the room together jamming. That's yeah. great. And man. try to leave room for a lot of improvisation and and it's just the feeling that that we aspire to is And that like, stuck, the improvisation stuck, you can hear them on the record? Oh yeah, always. Oh that's great. Always with us. So the, the last record had the least of it ever. Because uh-huh. a lot we did with with Danger Mouse we like looped drums over yeah. up on top, tried yeah. doing it a different way. Right. And you know, it has its positive things. There's nothing wrong with making music like that. It's just different. When did when did the music start really becoming a part of your life? Was it when you were fifteen? When you were like what did you start with? No, I when, read I, some, when I was I read like some a, stuff. I I know some things, but I'd rather yeah. you tell me. Well when, like when I first heard my stepdad play jazz when I was a little kid, I was deeply moved. I was taught, okay, here's a magic that exists that is up and beyond anything I've ever seen in my life. Jazz. Jazz. It is kind of like that, because it's weird, because I listen to it, and I'm trying to, you know, I, I, over the last you know five or six years, I've gotten into it uh, as best I can. I don't know everybody, but it is something that if you have an ear for it and, and you do connect with it, it just continues to evolve with you. Yeah. There's... Like, it, the same record. You listen like yeah. I can listen to uh, you know uh, uh, the, the 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 Miles uh, some uh, kind of blue. No, the fir- the one with Herbie, the first one uh, uh, in, a, si- in a silent way. In a silent way, like I can listen to that fucking over and over again yeah. and just be like, what the fuck? Yeah, dude. This morning I listened to Kind of Blue. I was doing yeah. my morning exercise. I listened to Kind of Blue, and. I've listened to that album probably more than any album in my whole life. It's yeah. like my comfort record. Right, right. And I just got this new pressing of yeah. it. There's these guys that make these real high fidelity pressings. They got old master tapes, single what step mastering. That? I can't remember what it's called. It's like O H R U or something. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I, I know those guys. Like yeah, 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 they yeah, make yeah. these real high yeah, quality yeah. pressings. Um, it's, it's not all. Sometimes I like the old ones. You're more yeah, maybe me, just yeah. cause easier. I'm used to listening to it the old sure. way. But but I put it on this morning and I was just like. In awe. And I've listened to this record a thousand times. I know every note. Yeah, and, yeah. And I was just like sitting here like, you know, doing my sit-ups and shit. And just like, like, oh my God, it's so beautiful. Like Bill Evans, his piano playing. Oh, like, I just started getting really into him, man. Dude. 
So what the fuck what is that? What the fuck, you know? And, and his relationship with Miles, I think, is really beautiful. And his liner notes, just his liner notes. And you ever read his liner notes on Kind of Blue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like he likens the, that kind of improvisation to those Japanese painters who yeah. paint on that really delicate rice yeah, paper. Yeah, 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 and if you make one mistake, the whole thing, that's it. It's done. He learned a lot from Miles. Like, I mean, you know, like... You know, yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Miles, man. So... Did you ever meet that guy? I never did meet Miles, no. Because, like, I just bought a bunch of Bill Evans. Like, I lock in and I just start getting the Bill Evans thing. Because, yeah. like, and also the fact that, like, you know, like, he was on the nod for, like, a lot of that shit. Yeah. And, like, so it is. It, it, I don't even know that. I, yeah, I, he was strung out, you mm -hmm. know, like the rest of them. But you, but I start to feel that, like, you know, because, you know, there are dudes that are either going to get lost in the shit because they just get lost in the shit or it's facilitated by dope. And I'm not yeah. saying that's a good thing, but it no. happened. Yeah. Well, certainly, look, we all know. You know, the heroin is a soul sucking, will steal all of your juice and leave you a fucking mess for the rest of your life. Yes. But they're like anything. There's a reason why people kill themselves for it. Yeah. Well, there's a relationship <laughs> with it that, you know, is never going to end well. But sometimes like at the beginning and for a few yeah. years. Yeah. Hey, and look, <laughs> don't do heroin, kids. But, you know, they had that that. That living in that bubble, blocking everything right, else right, out, right, right, right. completely lost right. in the music where nothing else exists in the planet. Yes, yes. You know, and yeah. graded, it, it would be better to get there by, you know, doing your Zen meditation and sure. stuff. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, we can't pretend like that didn't aid yeah. at certain times. Sure. You know? But, so you're listening to that today, and you, you, you hear something new every time. Every time. But, yeah. but when you were a kid, even though that was your inspiration, you didn't pursue it. Well, no, I did. As a as a youngster, I wanted just to be a jazz trumpet player. Yeah, and I was a little wild. Like I probably didn't practice enough and stuff. But I had a, a natural thing. I'm a trumpet. You did. I, yeah, could, yeah. I could make a beautiful sound. And um, just when I was kind of getting to the point where I was, it would have been. I would have started ramping up because yeah. I would have gone somewhere to just work on that. Yeah. Right at that point, I met Halal Slovak with Anthony. We became best friends. So you met him after Anthony. Um, no, yeah, after Anthony. I met Anthony when I was 15, and I think when we were 16, we were out hitchhiking in North Hollywood one day, and Hillel came driving by in his Datsun B210 listening to Rush. I had a B210. Yeah, okay. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> was it olive green? In my first, no, it was like kind of weird shit brown. I know that color. <laughs> yeah. It was Anyways, my first car. It was, his, it was the only car any of us had ever. He was like, whoa, he's got a car and a yeah. tape deck, and he's yeah, fucking yeah, cranking yeah. La Via Strangiata <laughs> and picked us up. And, um, and we became best friends. And then, like, you know, uh, months later, he was like, he was in a rock band, uh -huh. you know, called Anthem in yeah. high school. And he didn't like the bass player. And months later, he was like, you know, why don't you learn to play the bass and play? And I had kind of like, I didn't like rock music at all. Because I just thought, look, the rock music is for dumb people. Yeah. Let's face it. It's for people who care about haircuts more than music. But did you get that from your stepdad? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All the way. You yeah. know what I mean? And when I was little, I didn't. At first, it was just all music. Yeah. Charlie Parker, the Beatles. I just, it was music. Right. Sure. It was beautiful. Yeah. But I'd, I'd, I'd gone that, and I was a trumpet player. and yeah. I, blah, blah, blah. yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And you're 15. I'm 15. 15 yeah. Right. Yeah. But I, but then I'd started going to like go by his rehearsals. They were playing in the Friends house. I was like, God, they just do it with no teachers around, and they play stuff, and they're really having fun at Cool. And yeah, the were, they, were the girls hanging yeah, around? Yeah, yeah, you know, there's yeah, yeah. girls that like the band and stuff. And he was like, "Look, you know, Todd, the bass player, Todd yeah. Strassman. He was like, dude, Todd's not serious about it. Doesn't really want to do this. Yeah. He's not ready to give his life to it. We're 15, yeah. you, know, you know. And he's like, you know, why don't you learn to play the bass and be in the band? And I remember just sitting there, like, like feeling. <laughs> so, I, I, like, more than anything, loved. Yeah. Oh, right. You know? Yeah, like... Because like, I was always kind of a weird outcast kid. You know, I met... I'd have one best friend, and that was it. That was Anthony? It was Anthony, yeah. But I was like that in New York, too, when I was a kid. Well, you that's know? a weird thing about, like, growing up in, 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 in around the sickness uh, of whatever selfishness that parents are like, is that, mm -hmm. like, there's an awkwardness to it. You always feel... I, I always felt, like, kind of awkward and weird, and you just latch on to people in an overcommitted way. Yeah. It was really always exhausting, I think, to be yeah. my friend. The one friend. You, you totally, yeah, yeah. Right? And it's like, you know, when you... Then you get older and you just like married. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, you know. Hey, you know. Latch on. And then you don't know what to do once you're there. Then you're like, don't touch me, though. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then you exhaust yeah. them and they go away. Yeah, and you deal with your trauma. You know yeah. what I mean? And Eventually. hopefully you feel it enough to like evolve through it. Yeah, you know? no shit. Yeah, that dude. could take a lifetime. Dude, yeah, you know. Yeah. Talk to me. Yeah. Um, so but, you're there with the, So you found your guys. 
So yeah, you know, and he. So I started playing bass with Halal, and and. But um, you, would you just pick up bass? Have we? Have you just... yeah, I literally just picked it up. Two weeks later, I was on stage at Gazari's on the Sunset sure. Strip, playing a gig. With a, who's two ba- weeks later? Who's bass? Your dad? I got one. Oh, you just bought one? I got No, I borrowed one. I think the first one, I borrowed one from my friend Tree, who I started the music school with. Yeah. His father had a bass. His father played in Sha Na Na. Oh, yeah. Sang in Sha, sure. like a later version of Sha Na Na, yeah, like yeah. the Bowser yeah, sure. spot or yeah. whatever. And had a bass, or a, a, a guild bass, and I'm pretty sure that was the first one. And I just kind of went by the numbers. Dun, 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 Hey there, baby. Yeah. Have you heard the news? Yeah. <laughs> one way woman, I don't know if I jams. Yeah, one way yeah, woman, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. and um, and that was it, man. And then you know that changed my life, you know. And you stayed on the bass. I stayed on the bass. But what else? So, you... that, so I didn't go into being a jazz trumpet player at that point. But yeah. So the, and that was the beginning of it. So you were all, almost what entirely self taught in that way. Yeah, absolutely on the bass. Never had a lesson. Had one lesson. With who? Uh, a guy at the music school on Fairfax. I went in, and I remember he gave me the sheet music to take it easy by the Eagles. <laughs> and it was like, you know, I want you to learn this. And I, yeah. and I just didn't do it. I yeah. just, you know. Yeah. I didn't like, and when I started liking rock music, I just went right to, like, Hendrix was, that was it. You know, I like Hendrix. I Did Hillel like, tell you you're on to Hendrix? Uh-huh. Because, like, the what I was going to say, like, w- at the beginning of all this was that there was something about... Specifically for me, for some reason, uh, you know, that the song, was it Behind the Sun? Mm-hmm. Behind the Sun. Like, do you do, 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 Yeah, do, yeah, do, 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 do. those riffs. That's a halal riff. All I long. know. So, like, but I feel that, come, like, there's some spirit of that that goes all the way through, man. Yeah, thank you. Do you? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, because there's the the, the funky stuff, but then yeah. like all like it feels like all the sort of the stuff that's more psychedelic or more kind of you know lyrical in that way musically, yeah. mm-hmm. it kind of comes from that. From no, that totally. Dude. Like you know, look when when John joined the Chili Peppers, he was 17 years old. We're like um, eight nine years older than John, the yeah. rest of us, and um, and. You know, he had seen the Chili Peppers numerous times as like a 15-year-old or 14-year-old, yeah. 16. I can't remember, right in there. And he loved it. And he loved Hillel, you know? Yeah. And um, Chili Peppers became his favorite band. And, you know, and then we met him and, you know, he was just this unbelievably, like we couldn't even believe like how, how capable he was and how focused and diligent and and uh, hard working now like what happens with all that i mean because i know there was a lot of people coming in and out of bands you were in other bands you played with fear for a while be, you know mm-hmm. in, in between like before the chili peppers yeah, I, I left anthem changed its name to what is this and then we were the new originals yeah. and then the, no <laughs> yeah. anthem changed its name to what is this <laughs> yeah yeah and then and it became like more new wave kind of prog rock because what year is that i mean is that's it, like 1981 so so and so then punk is sort of Happening, punk still? is happening, and we were like decidedly not punk. We were huh. like prog rock, and you're in but LA. I loved, but I started loving punk a lot because this is where it happened. Yeah, this is where it happened. And you were a kid in the middle of it. Yes, and then and and I was like, and 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 then I, I one night I saw Fear play. I dosed myself with a hit of acid, went to the club lingerie, saw Fear play, and was blown away. Cause, I mean, they were such great musicians, those guys. Yeah. Philo and Spit. And, and I saw them play, and I was just like, man, I, next day I was like, oh, I saw the greatest show. You wouldn't even believe it. The guy, the way the guy's hands dance on the strings, like the, yeah. the drums, he was playing his beat in 5 4 on oil yeah. cans. It was insane. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then. And then literally like five days later, I'm looking at the LA Weekly like I did every day to see who's playing and where am I going at night because I went out every single night to see bands play and, and I see a thing, fear looking for a new bass player. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> and I was, hello, I'll be there. <laughs> yeah. And they hired me and I was a kid. They were, I was like, I was 18, 19. So you're you're learning on the job. Yeah, well, I would, but I'd already like kind of got proficient at the bass, yeah. playing what is this, and um, and they hired me, you know, and I left what is this and started playing with them, and I was with them for about a year, and while I was with them, started the Chili Peppers. Now, like who, like who are the bands that you're seeing all the time? What, how is your brain expanding around? Like because all the LA punk bands are happening. Yeah, I saw every single one of them. Yeah, and you knew them. 
Mm, sometimes I wasn't, you know, I knew who'd, some. Who'd you Later, go? when Chili Pepper started, I started knowing people. Who who did you go to see the most? Like, who were the ones where you're like, you can't fucking miss it? X. Oh, yeah. I loved X. I the, still love X. Nobody like, sounds like them, dude. They, so they do great. not get the, the credit they deserve. It's really a local phenomenon, and it's sad, because the first three records... Oh, my God. The first three yeah. records are phenomenal records. And, like, I, I was seeing this thing the other day, like, it was on actually on Sports Talk Radio. I listen to Sports sure, Talk Radio. Sure. And they're talking about what record is the most... L.A. record of all time. And, you know, they got The Doors, they got N.W.A., they yeah. got Dr. Dre, okay. they got, and, and I'm just sitting there in a car going, the greatest L.A. music of all time is X. Yeah. Period. Yeah. And that's no, you know, no denying the greatness of Dr. Dre or The Doors or Jim Morrison. Like, right. you know, those guys are great. Right. I love those records. Right. But from my experience, yeah. <laughs> for me walking down the street as yeah. a kid with nothing in my pocket, thinking how I'm going to steal some food, yeah. it was X. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I listened to those first few records uh, recently mm. and the thing about it is it's like they're this strange kind of specifically American music that they wrenched out of the ether on their own and nothing sounds like it and and, and, the, and the lyrics are so poetic yeah and, and those the way harmonies they, dude the way they sing together and yeah everyone, everyone always made fun of Vaccine's voice like I remember like what yeah it's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard and her like John Doe with like a classic tenor like the two of them together those harmonies the way it went so I just great. saw them like six like six months ago. No, or man, like, I haven't I, seen them in a long time. I saw them in Orange County. We went to an outdoor thing, you know, in the middle of COVID, me yeah. and my friend Dan. Yeah. And they were great. Right. They played with the Blasters. Who played guitar? Oh, Billy who? Zoom's playing Rex. Please Yeah, Zoom's yeah. Back. He just sits down. Right. He sits down and smiles. Man, he's incredible. Amazing. And I saw the, so I saw them play the star everywhere they played. I saw him constantly. But you know, I would see everyone that played. That's the ones that I saw the most. Like if I could get in, I yeah. went. Yeah. You know, it was yeah. always a hustle to get in, you know. But X wasn't really would would you call that cuz there was weirder, looser, more raw punk going on. Yeah. I mean, like all the bands like Youth Brigade and Channel 3 and Red Scare and um uh, you know, Black Flag, I never saw the germs, I never saw the weirdos, well, later I saw the weirdos. Um, but, like, at that time when I came in, it was kind of late, like that first wave of L.A. punk, yeah. like the great bands, like the germs, the yeah, weirdos, they're the gone. That's the 70s? They were already done. Right. Um, right. But then when I, when the Chili Peppers started, yeah. and we started, you know, like, from the get-go, we, we, you know, we became, in a very underground way, popular in Los yeah. Angeles um, in 1983. Um, then I became, you know, got to know a lot of those people and was really happy about it. You yeah. Know? So what were like, let's go over these shifts in the lineup over the years. So how did, when did you finally end up on the, the lineup that sort of lasted with Chad on drum? Like you had other drummers, right? Okay. So we start off, it's me, Anthony, Hillel and Jack. Yeah. Play our first ever show, no rehearsal, go play one song. We had one song, we played one song. Yeah. We went crazy, had a spiritual awakening, the whole universe, like, zeitgeisted together into yeah. this thing. And we knew it. Yeah. And um, then at that point, that became the focus of my life. Right. Um, so that we had that. Then before we made our first record, Jack and Halal were still playing in What Is This, the band yeah. that I left, the high school band. Yeah. They both left. Yeah. We got Cliff Martinez and drums, who had played in The Weirdos, The Dickies, and Captain Beefheart. Yeah. And Jack Sherman on guitar. Um, yeah, who was... And it's still you and Anthony. And me and Anthony. Always yeah. me and Anthony. Yeah. And then we made the first record with them. Um, and we went and did the first tour, first record. Second record, um, Jack Sher Halal wanted to come back. So we said goodbye to Jack Sherman. We brought Halal back. How much drama with all these? Every time drama. <laughs> Every time I say one of those things, it's like me up, like dry heaving yeah, for days, yeah, puking with yeah, with stress. Yeah, uh, yeah. And even when I really knew it was the right thing to do. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Hard, man. Yeah. Someone, you know, you play with someone, it's, a, it's like, it's, it's like vulnerable yeah. connected experience yeah. even when you're really struggling with them yeah, it yeah, is yeah, you know because yeah. you're always yearning and reaching for this thing you know yeah um but so then uh, we make the second record, Freaky Style, with Cliff Martinez on drums and Hillel. Yeah. After that, that was with George Clinton in Detroit at United right. Sound. Yeah. Wild, wild time. Yeah. And then we went and lived with George for months on end, yeah, and yeah. it was just wild. And yeah. The first night, I'm sleeping. George lived at a farm yeah. in Clinton, Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> I'm lying there. I'm asleep at night. And, you know, we're, we're, I'm like Dr. Frankenstein's house, sleeping on the floor in a sleeping bag, you know. Yeah, yeah. In the middle of the morning, like crack of dawn, I hear like, 
like a gun. I'm like, what the fuck? I look up, I see George in his underwear. You know, he has his own colored braids and shit up with a gun growing for, running for the outside. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my fucking God, what's going on? <laughs> and he was going out to shoot a deer. He saw a deer and he was into hunting, yeah. eating wild game. Yeah. But, you know, it was just wild. Did man. he get it? I, I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> But he was he was hunting. He was yeah. really into hunting and, and yeah. in his underwear in the morning. It was, he saw one and he was yeah, like, "I'm yeah, gonna yeah. go get that motherfucker." Yeah, yeah. He yeah. was up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so then, um, make freaky styly. We tore freaky styly. Then after that, uh, Jack wanted to come back. Halal leaves. Jack comes back. Yeah. So we have the original lineup. I mean, I mean, I'm um, Cliff leaves. Yeah. Jack comes back. Yeah. Cliff went on to have a great career making soundtracks to all the Steven Soderbergh films. Uh-huh. Oscar nominee, uh-huh. great, yeah. awesome dude. And he's a great, I love Cliff. Um, so then we have the original lineup back for the third album. And then after the third album, which is Uplift Mofo Party Plan with that lineup, we go do on tour, we get back, Halal overdosed and died. Now, how bad, was everybody strung out? Um, well, I mean, mostly like uh, Halal and Anthony went back and forth between being strung out. Yeah, but that wasn't your bag, that drug? I mean, it was. I just never got strung out. Uh. I like this stuff. I never, like, yeah. something in me always stopped me from going all the way. Uh, you know, like, I good. do heroin all the time. I did it, but yeah. I was always like, and I'd wake up the next day to feel sure too shitty to play basketball or do the stuff that I yeah. love to do. Yeah. And I wouldn't do it again. Sweaty and queasy. Yeah, but then like 10 days later, I'd be like, never again. Yeah, you know, and, I'd, yeah. and then like 10 days later, I'd be drunk out of the bar and like someone would give me a line of blow. And the next yeah. thing you know, I'd do it again. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Right, right. And I, I think I mean like once I did it two days in a row. I, I, oh, really? Yeah. So you really could just chip. And... I, I, I chipped. Yeah. 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 So so Halal died and that was devastating. I can't imagine. Absolutely fucking devastating. You know, How old was he? 22? <sighs> Fuck, man. 26, I think. Mm, wow. Yeah. And a beautiful guy. Like, yeah. I still have these paintings he made and stuff. That, like, he gave me for my birthday. He, was, he made these beautiful paintings, Mark. Like, yeah. He Like, so sensitive and gorgeous. Like, I have this one of this, like, like a naked woman lying on a blanket yeah. with a cat curled up by her hips. Like, and he just did this all the time. Like, he was just this beautiful guy. That's you so know? sad, man. Yeah. You know, it's the torturedness of the pain that makes kids you know we didn't know yet yeah. it's like didn't get to the point of figuring it out yeah you know yeah so we lost Halal yeah um which was hard for all of us um and then and Jack who had started playing music on the exact same day as Halal yeah when they were kids and for, after they had a kiss cover band with yeah. dressed up like kiss yeah uh, Halal, Jack was heartbroken and left the band just couldn't, couldn't handle it too much did he quit music um, no, he ended up being a drummer in Pearl Jam, oh. and he played with Joe Strummer. Okay, and he he did stuff. He's a yeah, still yeah. around. Yeah, yeah, still around. Yeah, still around. Still my friend. Um, he actually on our last tour for our last record, he toured with us as a one man act, one man show. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just like, which these crazy psychedelic <laughs> movies behind him, plays drums and his tapes. And, oh, wow. Yeah, he's a wild man. Okay. Yeah, um, Jack Irons, and then so then we go to make Mother's Milk. Um, First, we 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 got Chad. Where'd you get him? Because he seems like you know. Oh no! Before we got Chad, we had D.H. Peligro. Yeah. Oh and yeah, I know D.H. Yeah, D.H. who played him from in Dead, Dead Kennedys. Kennedys mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we hired on um, guitar Blackbird McKnight from Funkadelic. Wow. Who was a friend of mine. Yeah. And so we had D.H. and and that's and, interesting, huh? Yeah, and, and it just didn't. The reference points and stuff just didn't work out. Um, just for whatever the chemistry stuff, and so on the musical side. Yeah, so then, so then Blackbird left, and we we and and and, and no, while we had Blackbird, then I met John, and I was like, damn! I remember calling up Anthony; he was drying out up in yeah. Michigan. Yeah, I was like, dude, I met this kid. Like I jam D H and you come jam with my friend John. This kid's kid, he can fucking rip. D H introduced you. Yeah, yeah. D H introduced me. He, they had been jamming, and I went and jammed with John. And I was like, holy fuck. Yeah. Holy fuck. Yeah. This kid is good. Yeah. Like scintillating. Yeah. And not just show off. He even though he was, he was a kid, but yeah. like, damn, you know. Yeah. And um. All strats, right? Yes. You know, at the time he didn't play a strat. He had some. I don't know what it was. It had naked ladies all over it, <laughs> um, like some kind of modern like yeah, yeah. kind of guitar. And and uh, I called Anthony, and then Anthony came back, and then John Thelonious Monster picked him up. Our friends Bob, yeah, yeah Bob, yeah. played with Thelonious Monster, Bob and Pete. And then um, and then John, Anthony saw him play Monster, and was like, "We got to get that kid." And I was like, 
right? Yeah. And so we let go of Blackbird. We got John. And then we did a little tour with John and DH. And then um, DH, bless his heart, was dealing with some substance abuse shit. Mm. And and we, it, it was just, you know, not working out. And so we, we, we met Chad, who Denise Zoom who called Denise Zoom because she was married to Billy Zoom of X for some time, yeah. told us, I know a guy who eats drums for breakfast. Yeah. And that was Chad. Yeah. And we met Chad. He seems like he eats drums yeah. for breakfast. <laughs> yeah. And he does eat drums for breakfast. We met Chad, and then we made we made Mother's Milk with Michael Beinhorn, who had also produced the Uplift Mofo Party Plan, who we liked because he had made, he was in Material, the band with Bill Laswell that we really liked a lot. And, and Mother's Milk was the first big record, right? Yeah. And we hadn't really connected. Like, I feel like John hadn't really come into his own yet. He was still trying to fit in as opposed to just, like, letting his magic fly. Uh -huh. um, and we, But we made a record, and we did a, a, we did a cover of Stevie Wonder's Higher Ground that got us our first, like, <laughs> Who taught you how to do that if you didn't take any lessons? I just did it, man. You I heard that to swap that shit by yourself? Just did it on my own. No one said, like, this is just do No one head. ever showed me. <laughs> I, well, I remember seeing this kid... <laughs> At Fairfax High named Ray. Yeah. And when I was playing an anthem at school, we were like the white rock band. Yeah. There was a black funk band called Star. Yeah. And we were there was like the two bands at school. Yeah. And Ray played in Star. And I saw Ray one time at lunchtime sitting with there with a bass thumping. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, because Halal had just taught me, you go like that, like you're walking with your fingers. Yeah. You oh, know? The, and that the, was all I knew, walk. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know? To play. And I saw him stopping, and I just saw him do it, and I was like, whoa, what the fuck is that? And he kind of showed me. Yeah. But I, I didn't, and then like a year or so later, I just tried to figure it out, and it kind of made my own way. Yeah, yeah. I still do it my own weird way, different than other people do it. Yeah, that's okay. Popping and thumping, man. Yeah. Popping and thumping. That must have been exciting. Like, yeah, it was really fun. And when I started, like, it was when we, right before we did the, when the Chill Peppers got together, I just kind of found this way of doing it that was really my own way. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and yeah. it was like all those early Chill Peppers songs, Black Eyed Blonde, Get Up and Jump, Skinny Sweaty Man, uh, all these real fast, like a drum, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like that funky thing, but with punk rock energy that I loved, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, right. And just that's when we, you know, we found this sound. So, so with, 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 like, with different drummers, I mean, the rhythm section is the rhythm section, but you got on with, okay, with DH. Love DH. Yeah, I love as, a, as a rhythm section. So with Chad, um, did you guys just lock in? Yeah. Or well, did you learn from each other? It, it, we learned from each other. At first with Chad, I was a little worried because he was a real rock dude. Like super rock, like John Bonham school. He yeah, hit yeah. up our drums harder and more steady and more ferociously with more chops than anyone I'd ever played with. Right. Like a fucking monster. No jazz though. Well, it wasn't, I don't know if a jazz thing. And he knew like Detroit funk. He was a Detroit So he dude. could swing. He could swing and he had groove. But yeah. We just had like our arty thing. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I was saying before, we were really into like defunct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the contortions. Right. And gang. <laughs> yeah. Gang of Four. Yeah, yeah, Echo yeah. and the Bunny Man. Yeah, yeah. Susie and the Banshees. Yeah. Like we like this arty kind of music. Right. Bill Laswell, like Robert Laswell. Fripp. Fripp. You yeah. know what I mean? Like the Fripp, Not Crimson Fripp, but Fripp Fripp. Yeah, all, all of it. Yeah. All of it. But Chad, so and Chad had played like hair metal. You know what I mean? Yeah. But he was incredible. But but thing is the the ferocity with which he played was undeniable. That's so, but that's so it's it's like uh, some sort of serendipitous miracle. It was because like you know you have these alter alter you know, ulterior not ulterior but different forces. But you you the alchemy of it made you the modern chili. Peppers. Absolutely, and he bought us. In a way, like in his power and his sensibility, bought us from something that probably would have been less open to the whole world. Right. You know what I mean? Like he opened it up with that big open beats. Well, that's the drums, man. It's like yeah. I talked to Billy Gibbons and, you know, because <laughs> those records later, the, 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 the bearded ZZ Top records, which are my favorite. Yeah. I'm like, how'd that happen? And he, the, he said, our manager said, girls can't dance to this shit that you're doing. Right. So figure yeah. it out. Yeah. And that's where you get and that. And drummers too. Like, look at the clash without Topper Hedden. Uh-huh. I love the fucking Clash, dude. One of yeah. my favorite rock bands of all time. Yeah. But without Topper Hedden, when they get the other dude, yeah. It doesn't it's just not as good. Yeah. Look at REM. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, uh, drummers are very uh, important. Uh, it's like so important, you know, yeah. and we've been lucky to have great ones. Like really lucky. Like, Jack Irons a great drummer. Cliff Martinez, nothing like him. Yeah. Cuz I like I listened to like when they reissued that uh, Get Your Yayas out that Stones record. You mm -hmm. know, it was an Abco reissue. And I'd never really realized just uh, without Bill and Charlie that band just 
falls apart. Uh, right. Dude. All you of know. a sudden, you have these guys that are really good. You know what I mean? Like they go, They go and get really good musicians who do their job well. Yeah. Like great guys. Yeah. And they might have, but it's not like someone just being themselves. Like the thing about a lot of these guys is what they do is all they know how to do. That's so good, they don't though. Know it, and that's great. That's what you. Can, that's what makes the thing work. It's like you, you do your thing. Like, like yeah, you're like, you're like yeah, yeah. The, the restraint is a is a powerful and underappreciated sure, but, but thing res- in music. But because but, but restraint but, by by not by circumstance, right, you exactly. can't do anything else. That's right. The restraint you work just with by virtue of the fact this I, this is all I do. You found a thing, and you put all the, 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 all of yourself into it. The depth of your nervous system, your heart, your pain, your joy, your fucking right, trauma, right, all of it. Right. Well, that's rock and roll, man. Yeah, dude. Because like it's it, jazz it, too, and punk, and all of and it. And Stravinsky. I guess, but like then you start getting more because guys who Still. can do everything, you know, guys who are, are virtuosos. Yeah, a lot of times they're too good. Yeah, but sometimes there are guys who are virtuosos who are still simple. Not a matter of simple or complicated, right? But are able to still not to still be themselves oh, tr- and oh, be right. themselves okay, and not that's- fucking. They're humble enough and believe enough in their aesthetic and the that, well, that's path true. That okay, that's make. a good point. Yeah, but, that, the belief in their aesthetic is a good point because a lot of times, if you have natural vers- virtuosity, you're 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 compelled to mimicry. Yeah, like you can do anything. Exactly. Like you look at look at Duke Ellington. Yeah, the guy changed his whole career. He could do everything. Right. You ever hear a Duke Ellington record? Didn't sound like Duke Ellington. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's just because he's himself so much and trusts himself and is close to his spirit and his heart. Mm. He's not just fucking... It's, it's it's making sure that gets out. And I think a lot of guys who are talented and even amazing don't always get it out. Yeah. They don't always... You, you can't... And the simple... Sometimes the simplest players... It's sort of so fucking honest, yeah. Because they're putting oh. everything they can into the yeah. into the the range that they work in. Bob Marley, I know. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like Family Man, like those sure. the, like, reggae stuff. A right? lot of those old blues dudes. It's like the, the guys who built the thing. Lightning Hopkins, yeah, man. Come on, dude. and th- nothing sounds like that guy. No. And nothing. you can't even play like that. No, nobody can. That's Captain wild. Beefheart. Beefheart. Yeah. You know? Captain Beefheart and Howlin' Wolf. Yeah. Like yeah. That. Hey, yeah. Beef, I, Beefheart's... I've been listening to a lot of Zappa, dude. Oh, I don't dude. even know why. I, you know, I need to because I don't... Like, I, I love Beefheart, especially like Trout Mass Replica kind of changed my life sure. in a way. Yeah. Um, But I don't know Zappa that well. The only record I've ever listened to a lot is is The Hot Rats. Yeah. Um. Oh. 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 And and uh. What's the one? Sugarcane Harris on violin. Sugarcane. Awesome. Remember one time being at a party and he dropped a fucking bindle of heroin out of his pocket on the floor. Sugarcane. Pick that shit up. (laughs) (laughs) Could have picked it up. (laughs) Picked it up. (laughs) I can't remember. I. I can't remember. I hope up, we right? gave it back to him. <laughs> hey, hey, drugs, you know, drug time's different. Drug, you know, like, yeah, yeah. Drug, all, when drugs are involved, you the, know, the ethos always, is a whole, it's a whole ethos is different. Yeah. Drug ethos. We, I just, uh, yeah, but listening to, I don't know why, but it was just a couple of weeks ago where I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to go through this Zappa catalog mm. when I hike. Mm. So I've been doing it, like the first five albums. Great. And like, when, and by the time you get to apostrophe, I'm like, holy fuck. Yeah. Like, I almost, I had to stop myself from emailing Dweezil to say, what kind of guitar is your dad playing on yeah. apostrophe? I know he'll know, and he probably has the guitar. Yeah. But th- what difference does it make? When it- yeah, I, I, I got to get into it. I'm, I'm kind of uneducated on that front. Well, there's a lot there, and it's intimidating, but but it's its its, its own thing, and it's very clean and very interesting and very, you know, like uh, yeah. multi layered. But yeah. I mean, I'm not like a Zappa nerd, but yeah. for some reason, sometimes I'm like, I think I'm ready. Yeah, but it's, it's really- good to, great to be like, man, I. I, It'll open I just you like up. so much music. You sure. Know? So okay. So the evolution then. So why so many ins and outs with John? Um, because John is an intense guy who lives in the moment of his feelings, and when he gets to a point where he needs to evolve in a way, and he knows it, yeah, and he can't do it in the band, he goes. Oh, uh, okay. Basically, I mean, I, I, that's the simplest way I can put it. Yeah. And I don't feel right to speak for him. But I know, um, you know how a lot of people will say they don't care about being famous? Yeah. Like they just care about art. Yeah. But then they keep doing everything they can to be famous. Like yes. John literally doesn't give a fuck about being famous. Yeah. And how about the rest of you? Um, yeah, you know, look, hey, I like to make a buck as much as the next guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. And, and I'm a Hollywood kid, you yeah. know? 
I mean, I don't spend my life trying to be famous. I, 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 my, 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 <laughs> my thing on it is this, and and that's a good question because I don't. I, I'd like for me to be honest about. Yeah. Because that's hard for me to really know. I know that whatever degree of fame I have or don't have. The thing that's crucial to me is that everything comes from an organic place. That if you make something beautiful, you make a beautiful piece of art, you do something that's good, good things will come from it. And if, and part of that is respect from your peers and from people who care about art and stuff. Right. And it's interesting that you say you're a Hollywood kid because, you know, the difference there is that you guys became, you know, sort of fixtures here, right? And mm-hmm. people knew you, and mm-hmm. you're in all these different scenes, mm-hmm. and everyone's coming up. So all of a sudden, you know, you're acting in movies. People want to put you in movies to, yeah. you know, to do some version of yourself because yeah. you are a thing. And I, well, and I love movies. That's yeah. the thing is, like, like, I don't act in movies to be famous. Right. I mean, I don't. The thing is, I'm not against being famous. But you're not going out for auditions. But, people ask you to be in movies, yeah, right? And I, I love movies. Yeah. I love acting. Yeah. Like, and especially like the last 10 years, like a few things happened that made me take it very seriously. Oh, yeah? Like the craft of it. Yeah, like which things? Well, why particularly, did, why? I did this one uh, underground, like, you know, low be- called Lowdown yeah. with John Hawks, yeah. Al oh, Fanning, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and uh, this woman I met who's the same age as me, named named Amy, yeah. Amy Albany. Her father was Joe Albany. He was a great jazz pianist, played with Charlie Parker, Mingus, you know, great dude. Um, come to 70s, like me, same age as me, she was living in Hollywood. Her dad, who was a brilliant jazz bebop pianist, was strung out on dope. They're living in like a crackhead hooker apartment on Hollywood and Western, one of those buildings right there in Hollywood and Western. And, you know, she was this guy she admired, who's, a, who's, who's her everything, yeah. who loves her more than anything. This yeah. brilliant guy is a fucking disaster, heroin addict, yeah. mess. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And she wrote, a, she wrote a memoir about it, and a yeah. movie was made about it. Okay. And so I get the script. I'm like, this is my fucking story. I couldn't even believe it. Like, yeah. I was shaking and crying reading it. Yeah. And then um, I, uh, and it was about, like, what I grew up in. Yeah. And here I am playing one of these jazz guys. Like, John Hawks played the main guy, her dad. I played the friend, the junkie friend. Uh-huh. And I was like, I... I got to honor this. I can't just show up and wing it and be flea. Right. So I went out and got an acting coach. I started studying acting in a guy named Peter Lewis, yeah. who's incredible. Ed Norton uh-huh. uh, turned me on to him, and he's a brilliant fucking yeah, man. Yeah. And he just started teaching me, and I started really taking the craft seriously. And the, the, the thing I learned more than anything, yeah. like I don't know all these techniques, you know, smarten up an object. Uh, yeah. Stella Adler always said that, you know, whatever, all these yeah, things yeah. that are great. Yeah. You know, write a journal as, as a character for months and months and months before. Like no all this shit. Stuff. You do that? I do that. Uh-huh. I take it damn fucking serious yeah. now. And, 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 um, well, what did he teach you? What were you going to say? It, but, but the thing that he taught me more yeah. than anything was or that I learned, I don't yeah. specifically taught me, that as a music, as a musician, I do all my scales, I do all my stuff, I do my study, I do my practice, I do my work, but there comes a time when all that matters is getting gone. You know what I mean? Like all that matters is like when I met my best showing up to be the present. Yeah. Just you let go. Hopefully you can channel the spirits, live in a place beyond thought where you're fucking channeling the great fucking gods of the galaxy. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. you're just like, you've done the work where if that wave chooses to come through you, you let it come. Get yeah. out the fuck out the way. Right. And I learned that that can happen in acting. I didn't know that. Right. You know? And yeah. so, so, so I learned how to do all the work and get to a place where you fucking let it go and let that happen. And a lot of it has to do with learning what to do is. What is the preparation? What is the work? What is the stuff? And, and so since then, I've taken it really seriously, you know? That's great. Yeah. So anyways, that, that sounds like, you know, that a lot of that work, like, like when you, when, why'd you get sober? Um, well, I'm not entirely sober. I'm not, a, oh. I'm not, a, I'm not on the program. Oh, okay. Um, but I am pretty much mostly sober. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, once in a blue moon, I'll drink a, like a half a beer. Or, yeah, yeah. Or take a hit off a joint or something. But yeah. like blue moon, I'm just not. I stopped doing drugs entirely when I turned about 30 years old. Everything. Um, I guess you see enough people die and get strung if out. Everyone was yet. dying, getting strung out. But more than that, yeah. I remember having a talk with someone once and. Um, I was talk, talking about being a dad, and my daughter was about, I don't know, four years old or something, and mm. I would like get high when I was away from her or whatever, mm. and think, oh, I don't do it when I'm around her or whatever. Yeah. And I remember, and they said, like, all that matters as a parent is to be present for your kid and be communicative, yeah. and you have to be communicating with them when you're not around them. Huh. You have to be, it's like being in a state where you're always there for them, like your spirit is 
always available huh. whenever they need you. Huh. And that really resonated with me. And I, you know, I love my kids so much. And I was just like, I, that's, that I was gotta, it. I got to be there. Huh. And I was tortured enough on my own. Like I spent so much of my life, like riddled with panic attacks and anxiety. And, um, that's from dr- growing up in chaos, from growing up in chaos and like not knowing how to be in a relationship yeah. and hurting myself, hurting other people. Yeah. I just, you know, I didn't want to do it anymore. And I knew and I started getting like vague little hints of spirituality and stuff. And I like knew what? that like, like I'd read books. Yeah. I got a yoga teacher. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I got sick. I got real sick. I got chronic fatigue and stuff. All this stuff happened to me. And I was just did like, you kick it. Yeah, I did. Huh? I did. And, and I, and I, and at that point I was like, I want to be, I want to feel everything. I need to feel the pain. I'm never going to run from it again. So what's your practice? My, my practice now, like right now, I'm meditating. I pray. You know, yeah. I'm not religious, but I pray every morning I get out of bed. I practice. I pray every time I eat food. I what pray. kind of meditating? Um, I do TM mostly. I also learned this Vipassana. I like went to these Vipassana meditation retreats uh-huh. to learn that technique. And that works for you? Um, yeah, it helps me. It's not always easy. So, as a matter of fact, sometimes it's damn right painful. Mm. But um, In what way? But I just have to like parts of myself come up, fear and anxiety uh, that, you know what I mean? Like yeah. in a deep way, like, yeah. like I'll be sitting there and all of a sudden I'll be overwhelmed with like shaking, sweating. Really? Yeah. Like just this pain. It's like this icy fucking grip grabbing a hold of me. Like I'm going to take you down to the bottomless pits of hell. Like that kind of feeling. Like a, a fear and anxiety? Yeah. Just, yeah. Like... Yeah, oh, triggered wow. by some little thought that I don't wow. even know what it is. You huh. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so, but I know that when I feel it, I start to have more of an understanding. And I, I start to understand, okay. You I'm integrate not gonna, it. I integrate it, and I'm not going to let it run my life. Right. Like, I'm going to feel it. And yes, I'm in fucking pain today. But I'm not going to let it make make me go make some ridiculous decision in my life that's yeah, not good. Yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? Feel yeah. the pain. Carry it around. Like, I'm flea walking around, and I'm in pain. Yeah. You know what I mean? Hey, how yeah. you doing? How can I help? <laughs> you, you know well, what I mean? that's the thing. You do help, right? So you set up the, the school, too. I mean, you, you know, service is a big part of your thing. Big part of my thing. And it got really amplified during the pandemic, too, in a really, really? cool way. How? Um, Well, just like when the pandemic hit, I got, I loved it, right? Like, you know. No one's doing nothing. Living up in my compound in Malibu, dude. I'm like. Is that where you're at? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I don't have to go. I don't live there anymore. I actually moved because I got married and things got different. But, 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 um. I was like, man, all of a sudden I didn't have to go on tour. Yeah. And the first, a real lockdown, we stopped rehearsing. You know yeah. what I mean? It was yeah. like, right. and I, I, was in, I never have that kind of time. Yeah. And I was like, man, I'm going to go shoot hoops today. Yeah. I'm going to go get in the ocean. I'm just going to practice bass for six hours. <laughs> yeah. The fuck yeah. you think about that world? Yeah. I'm going to go in the garage and make crazy noises because I feel like it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it was just so great. And then I started thinking, damn, it's all nice for me because I got the money to like, roll through this and mm. I started thinking about people who were really struggling because they didn't have work they didn't have you know people who live day to day all of a sudden completely yeah. fucked and so I got an idea to bring a food truck to like you know poor parts of LA yeah. and just just whatever I can do do something with my yeah. time and what I can help and then I found some people an organization in Watts that, that was doing groceries giveaways and I hooked up with them I said hey I'll bring a food truck and and then I just got really involved in that community you know and um, being a part of that met all these awesome people people I made friends and started building bridges and making friends with people who had whose experience so much different than mine right down the street man yeah like you know people who 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 are just like it's crazy the things you learn when you get into a place and listen you know yeah like the way like white supremacy and and systemic racism really works yeah like how it really affects people you know what i mean and and making friends on there and and i just got really involved and continue to be involved in community work there and and uh and that makes me really happy. That's you know? great. Well, yeah, yeah, really yeah. great. So that part of and the school, and I'm also we're starting a music school there as well. Like I'm doing a bunch of stuff, but we're starting the Watts Conservatory of Music as well. No kidding. And um, uh, yeah, it's been kind of. Um, I don't. I, I hate to talk about it because it's not. We haven't taught one fucking lesson yet. Right. But but, but you're working on it. They're working on it. Yeah. And the other schools kicking. Are you guys back in it? Yeah. Yeah. Back into full effect. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah, you know because we teach like 800 kids a week, man. 
you know, is in orchestra and choir. And it's like I meet so many kids. Now we've been together 20 years. I mean, I come in like I run into an adult and I'd be like, hey, you know, I went to your school for five years when I was a kid and it really changed my life. Oh, that's you know what I mean? Like I met all my friends there and we all became friends and yeah, we started yeah. weird bands and we did this and that. And now, you know, now I'm a I just, you know, I make teacups, whatever yeah, the fuck. Yeah, but yeah. but right. But the, the birth of their creativity and yeah, the community. Or, or whether or not it was just a cool thing for they to do. Sure, for some man. people, they might go be a musician for the rest of their lives. Right. That's but what I mean. Yeah. It, but it, but it could be anything. It's been really nice. And, and you've been a great, great help for that, being a part of the fun. Oh, thank you. So thank, thank you. you. It's always like, it's always fraught with me. I'm always nervous. <laughs> and I always get <laughs> Love it. angry and weird. But <laughs> Love it's it. hard to wrangle <laughs> a dinner crew of rich people. I, it's focus. fucked. I, I get it. <laughs> you know, all you got to do is go up there, get an amp and go, blah, 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 and jump around. Yeah, yeah. Like, Onto your face. It's so like I always it. have big plans when I host it, but I get up there. I'm like, "What the? F- listen to me!" I know. I'm I feel yelling bad. at Mo Aston, who's a hundred. <laughs> um, oh, I love Mo. <laughs> um, yeah, man. but so, anyways, what about Navarro? How that? You guys still friends or what? Yeah, I, I, I'd never see him. Sure, but like, you know? how did that? Did, did you like that version? Uh, I think it had really good moments. There mm. were times when it was great, and when it, when it worked, it worked, and when it didn't work, it really didn't work. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like just like chemistry wise, and sure. um, and drugs came into the picture yeah. in a way that were just like uh, untenable. You guys have like just sort of hammered through it. You know, like it's amazing that the the, the that he, that you and Anthony are alive. Yeah, you, you know. know what I mean. It's like Jesus. It's a just, long time, dude. And, and the crazy thing is, like, at least for me, yeah. like Anthony, I'm sure, has a different take on yeah. it than me. I never think about, like, well, we're going to keep going no matter what. Or, or like, I never have thoughts about, well, next year we're going to be doing this. Or, but it's just kind of like it always just kind of makes sense to keep doing it. Well, I mean, look, man, everyone seems to. If you can, they do. Like, you guys really make big new records. So you got to get like take that shit out there. I think it's you know it might be that thing of us being well for the most part completely sober. I'm probably the only one, and I am basically sober. Yeah, like, no, I get it. Like yeah. in my home life, like like put it this: my wife has never tasted alcohol in her whole life. Sure, sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah, that's yeah. how we are in my house. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but but we 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 feel everything, and. And by feeling everything, we always show up and we're like, let's get to work. And we never rest on our laurels. It's never this thing of like, like, oh, well, I'm going to be in the Caribbean, you know, eating papayas and sitting yeah, on a beach. Sure, sure. It's like, no, we're going to be in a room every day arguing about whether the bridge should be eight bars or 12 bars. Yeah. And whether this or that and still jamming and jamming to a finer groove where we're fucking drooling yeah. and lost in love with each other. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And also, you know, in a way... And I'm just kind of thinking of this now, yeah. like John leaving us and coming back and us having to continue like focus and reinvent. And every time it kind of we have to work to birth this thing again, yeah. it might save us because we have to be forced to keep working. Do you find it, are, do, do things evolve or change? I mean, like, yeah. you know, like when John comes back, is it sort of like, hmm, he's, he's yeah. in a different place now. He's in no? a different place. He's been through a whole journey making these records by himself. He's like elect. Deeply into like the sonics of his yeah, electronic yeah. music yeah, and the records. Shit. I've listened to some of it, yeah. Trippy shit. He's yeah. deep into it. Yeah. Like deep. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. he doesn't do shallow. Yeah, yeah. For Shante, don't do shallow. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and, and we've been growing and changing and doing our thing, like living. You know what I mean? Sure. And so we get back together and it's like, here's our guy. Like, we don't get to do this forever. Yeah. You know what I mean? Let's make the most beautiful thing we can. Let's show up for each other every day. Let's... And this and, is a big and, record. It's two records, right? Yeah. And there's that's a little bit of it. Huh? This is a small piece of it. There's, oh. <laughs> there's more? <laughs> we recorded a lot. How a many lot, songs? Mark. A lot. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what's the plan? I can't really talk about it. Oh, you got one, though? <laughs> kind of. Okay. Well, loosely, we we do and we don't, but but we recorded a lot of music, and we thought that these songs would go together and make a really good double album. Okay, okay. Yep. And you are you guys looking to tour? Um, we're absolutely looking to tour. We you know the record comes out on I think April first. Right. And we're gonna do some shows around that, and then come June we're starting a full on world tour. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right, man. Well, yeah. you, you seem ready. Yeah, I'm ready, man. I'm ready. It's you good know, to talk we have to you. work to do and stuff. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Mark. Great to talk to you always.